So let's go ahead and get started. So our guest speaker tonight is Betsy Wareham, and she is going to talk to us about uh, PERF and what it's all about. And she's got some different topics she's going to uh, talk about. I think uh, how they do the ratings and the pill system, etc. So I'm going to hand it over to Betsy. Thank you. Okay. So first off, I've had a very crazy day, so I'm not quite as prepared as I had intended to be. But as that is, that's what we get. Okay, so this is the PHRF handbook. Most everybody gets this online, but because I am old school, I asked for a copy. However, after this year, you won't get one. So PHRF actually stands for Pacific Handicap Racing Fleet, and the dash NW is of the Northwest. So it's not performance handicapping, it's Pacific handicap, <laughs> right? So PHRF was started actually in California. Um, and they were going for about four years when some people from the Northwest said, hey, we want to get on the bandwagon here and we want to have our, our group use this handicapping system. And that was back in 1966. And any of you that grew up in Seattle when I did <laughs> will know these names. Um, Tom Wheeler, Ralph Russell, and Walt Little were the original officers of the club. And Walt Little, it's kind of almost, a, well, it is a standing joke at Corinthian Yacht Club. There's a, there's a, I think there's still a plaque to him at Corinthian Yacht Club. He was the chief handicapper like forever. Um, so PHRF is a system of handicapping boats so that different boats can sail against each other. Makes sense. Not everybody has the same kind of boat except for you J70 guys. <laughs> um, so there is a handicappers council which I'm a member of, that all the yacht clubs that have, I think it's like six boats or more, have a representative. Um, I also do the Friday Harbor boats and usually the Lopez boats too. And then once in a while, I do somebody that just is in our area and doesn't even come from here, but they need a handicap, so I do that. So the first step, in PHRF handicapping is to fill out one of these forms and it says application for rating. And most of you have seen this, I think. You basically put the information about your boat, what, what kind of boat it is, if it is a type of boat, um, the weight, the length, the waterline length, and then you have to do the sail area, which is the more important part as far as most of us are concerned. And they send you this diagram. Well, this one looks a little complicated, but basically the, the four main measurements are I, J, P, and E. I and J refer to the forward triangle. So I being the hoist and J being the distance from the mast to the back. Okay, and OHP is the main hoist and E is the boom length, okay? Sprint boats or people that have a longer than normal spinnaker pull have a rating called JC, which goes out to here. And another one, if you have a spinnaker hoist higher than your forestay. Okay, so those things all factor into your rating. And all this stuff is available at the PHRF website, which is phrf-nw.org. Okay, so, so standard boats are pretty easy to rate because we have a great big table. And again, that's available online that tells you what the base rating for a boat is. So a base boat may not be the configuration that the boat is sailed in. 
Okay, so the Martins and the J70s both have small jibs and relatively bigger mains, but for their P and E, it's a standard main. You know, what's a standard? A standard is what they call a code five. So if you go into your little PHRF manual and you look at rig and sail dimensions um, and sail area formulas. Can you see that sail area formulas? Okay, well, you can't, I know. <laughs> so a standard gym is what's called a code five. And a code five is, is an overlapping gym because when they wrote all this stuff up, just about everybody had overlapping chips and the bullets were designed with overlapping chips. Um, the main sale is pretty easy because it's PE times 0.59. So that takes into effect a little bit of roach, but not a lot because you got a triangle, right? Um, so that's your base rating. So your, your base rating for a Inboard keel boat would be coded five, 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 five. The first five is for the jib area. The second five is for the spinnaker area. The third five is for the main. And the fourth one is for propulsion. So if you have uh, a standard inboard engine with a two blade prop or a folding prop, you're a code five for propulsion. And most everybody gets that code five for an inboard boat. If you're an outboard boat, you get a code M. I guess M for motor, I don't know. Anyway, so then you take the standard areas and compare that to the actual sail area. And that's where that measuring does, whoops. This is what happens when you only have a phone to talk. Okay, so that's where that measuring diagram comes in. You have to measure your largest sales. Okay, so you got the main, you've got one, two, three, four, and the headboard, five measurements. Okay, everybody follows that, I hope. And the jib is real easy. It's the hoist and the LP. <coughs> the LP is 90 degrees from the luff to the clue. And spinnakers, there was a, a whole lot of work done on spinnaker areas um, when we started getting all these asymmetrical boats. I mean, that was quite a while ago, but people quickly realized that using the standard spinnaker formula for an asymmetrical sail <coughs> gave a huge advantage to the people with asymmetric sails because it really did not um, return a true size. So you, you measure the luff and the leech, which in a, a symmetrical spinnaker are equal. And then on asymmetrical, they're obviously different. And then the max girth, and the foot, okay? So you take these as sailed measurements and compare them to the base measurements. And you do this great mathematical formula, which is all in here. Um, so anybody can look it up. But one of the things you'll find that people who have uh, boats that are one of a kind or um, there's not very many of them in the area so they don't have a one design fleet at all there's different bands so when I put a bigger spinnaker on the Red Eye Express I was paying I've forgotten what the penalty was, but I was a code eight spinnaker. So it's like three sizes bigger than normal. 
But I also found out that if I reduced the size of the spinnaker by one inch, I would be a code seven. So that would save me three seconds. <coughs> so people often play this game with their sail area to be at the maximum size of a particular rating band. So Chris and Justin, they maximize their sales to a lower rating band because they would rather have a smaller jib, but they want that smaller jib to be as big as they're allowed to have and still get a three second credit. Does that make sense to everybody? Yes, no, maybe. <laughs> okay. Yes. All right, so that's basically how yes. we so yeah. Yes, it makes sense. Oh, good. <laughs> Somebody's actually listening. Um, so that's that's the basics of ratings. So how do you come up with a rating in the first place for a brand new boat? Well, nowadays the manufacturers often say this is what we suggest for a rating. And the thing that's not so great about PHRF is depending on the area you sail in in the United States, you could have a different rating in the Northwest than you do in Southern California. And that's not such a great thing. But part of that reasoning is what kind of wind conditions you have where you sail. Um, if you're a boat that sails in a windy area all the time, um, you're going to get a little bit different rating if your boat is maximized for heavy air. Whereas in the Northwest, most of the time it's, it's fairly light. So our ratings tend to be a little lower than they are in other plates, parts of the country. Okay. So Betsy, I got a question on that. Okay. So you say they're lower. So I know there was some topic discussions around the J29 and my old boat, the J33 on the ratings versus <clears throat> California ratings. Do they use the same calculations? Um, you know, I'm not positive on that. One thing I know that they do in California, and I actually, I have, I've been trying to actually push this is they have a two wind rating, um, light air, heavy air. And, and I actually think that's a really good idea because, um, well, if you, I'll just give you an example, the dragon and the J 22, I don't know if they still do, but they have the same rating mm -hmm. and J 22 will wipe the dragon off the earth up here. But if you go to San Francisco Bay, the dragon will sail to its rating, right? Um, but the J-22 will just kill them up here. It's just it's not, it's not fair. Mm -hmm. So that, that's why I think there should be a heavy air, light air rating. But I haven't won that argument yet. <laughs> <laughs> um, currently, uh, the handicappers are working on... Um, trying to do a little bit more with uh, calculating. We have, you know, as you know, the sprit boats are, are becoming more and more popular and trying to get a little more equitable rating for those type of boats that have really deep keels, deep narrow keels and um, trying to maximize things like that. and. Just try to make everybody sail fairly, you know, make it, uh, make it equal, you know, and, and, and here's the one thing that I really wanted to emphasize uh, in this little talk is that um, PHRF has an annual meet, the handicappers have an annual meeting every year. And we actually have even uh, set up quarterly meetings. And the reason we did that was because people were complaining that we never did anything about ratings except once a year. Well, what happens is we set up a quarterly meeting and no one 
no one appeals any ratings. Okay, now what does that mean? It means that if you think a boat is unfairly rated, or if your boat is unfairly rated, you can appeal it. You have to fill out a form and turn it in to PHRF. You can do it online. Say, I'd like to appeal the rating on this and such boat. And then you have to present some evidence to that effect. But it is amazing to me how many people complain about ratings, but never ever make an appeal. And you have that ability, especially when you have a group of people saying, that boat is so badly rated. So you, you have the power to do something about it. Betsy? So I, yes. Um, I'll make a comment on that. And every time I make this comment, people suggest that I join PHRF in a, in a volunteer, you know, contribute manner, which so I'm reluctant to say any more stuff, but, <laughs> um, the, you know, with the advent of ORC and another variety of things, you have these computer generated, um, handicapping systems, which, mm -hmm which have problems in them themselves. They all have their various issues because their computers aren't, you know, as omnipotent as some of the people want to believe. But the, the dip and um, PHRF at times have, has been pushed into that because they go into all sorts of formula systems to figure out what is actually the true area of a spinnaker, uh, for example. But um, you know, PHRF is never was really a measurement system, even though we no. get busy measuring stuff. We're not actually calculating seconds per mile or any of this kind of thing directly. Um, PHRF is an observed performance system, and it's That's only correct. as good. It's only as good as the observations, and <clears throat> I've always been an advocate for PHRF to develop a central repository of race results where like big fleets like Round the County or Swiftsure or yada yada. And we have all this information every year from racing and we could, if we were paying attention, we could have you know, kept this stuff in a database for 20 years and know how these boats are actually performing, you know, where you have three different kinds of such and such basing against five other kinds of other things. You know, there's a lot of data out there. And when, when people go to their January meeting to appeal, you know, they bring in a couple races. Okay. Well, that's pathetic compared to what, you know, could be available if PHRF right. actively recording and keeping in their own database. And if they say there's an appeal, I mean, they could, the handicappers could pull up this data if it was preserved, right? I mean, we paid attention to it and nobody, nobody really has, you know, all the center sound series is the PSSR, PSSC, places, you know, where they get lots of boats. I don't know why, you know, um, uh, you know, it's an a PHRF is an observed performance deal. We got a lot of observations, but we're not paying attention to the observations very well is my, my uh, comment on that. Yeah, well, there's two things on that. One is more of that data is available now. Um, and there are some handicappers that are all over it. Uh, I'm not one of them. <laughs> I mean, I don't sail down sound, so I don't really know what's going on down there, but um, yeah, you'll find that someone who presents a good appeal has a lot of race data. They'll not, they'll, they won't just have one set of races. They'll have a lot. And, and I think that we're getting more of that because um, people are using uh, a centralized database for running their race results. And we don't, we run our own, right? But yeah. Um, there are, there are central databases and you can go look at uh, numerous races and say, da, da, da. 
but um, but you're right, that would be good. The second thing is your rating is based on your boat being well sailed and in really good condition. So if you have a boat that's got old sails and, and they're an average sailor, theoretically they shouldn't be doing as well as the guy that's got brand new sails and brings the sail maker aboard every chance he gets and you know has a consistent crew they they should do better in my opinion that's that's the racers that are making that boat go faster not not the boat itself and so that's that's not supposed to be a factor it's supposed to be if you put that same crew on anybody else's boat would they make it go as fast well uh, I, you, I, on that comment betsy I, you know my observation is with perf over the you know 20 some years of dealing with this thing and you've been doing it a lot longer but i've been to uh well i've had some friends that have appealed their rating you know in, in the the annual meeting and what my observation has been is that perf has been very quick to uh reduce handicap you know like charles model got his knockdown you know progressively after a lot of people started bitching uh, but if you go in there and you know you got a big heavy beneteau that is where they didn't re remove every last bit of furniture and cushion and everything like everybody else does and you want to get some relief right, right. there's none to be given you know they you right. they rarely help you out but they more often than not will hurt you because usually if you're winning then a lot of people are complaining about you and then you will get hurt. Yeah. Well, you know, we all know the story about Ginny and, and uh, how that, I said, I told, I mean, flat out told these people that you, this boat comes down, down sound, you will want his head. And guess what? That boat came down sound and all of a sudden they're going, Betsy, how come you haven't done this? And I said, because you didn't listen to me. <laughs> so there's some you know yep. there's some well, Mar Martha there. is another one of those you know Martha was Martha <laughs> won Ron the County here like you know four times and they they kept getting their handicap well of course who what's the, the guy that owned it he goes sure you know take my handicap down I deserve it you know but but that goes down yeah. pretty quick you know it goes down pretty quick but you never see it uh I mean it goes up or I don't right. know, you know, however I'm, you know, it gets worse, you know, more punitive quickly, but it won't go the other way to help people out very fast at all. No, no that's, a, that's, a, that's true. So I guess that's my question, Betsy. And, um, you know, I would, I would know how do, how do people know when they should appeal or not appeal or their rating is, is not correct. I mean, what's some of the indicators besides not winning races or always winning well, races? That's that, okay. So let's say you go to Whidbey Island Race Week and you're rated equal with another boat. So say two third, a 30 footer and a 33 footer are rated the same. And that boat smacks you every single race. And theoretically, if you're at Race Week, you should have a pretty good crew. I mean, you would hope you would. Um, so, so when you do something like that, where you have like a series and you can say, Hey, look at this boat. And if it's just that boat, then it's, then it's not the problem. They're the problem. Right. But if that happens, like you're, you get, get slammed out the back door every time and you have good starts and your sets are good and, and you didn't go the wrong way. Hey, that's a good time to appeal your rating. If you have a series of races that there's a lot of similar boats, that's the time you can really get, get a lot of evidence and say, hey, look, it, uh, this is not right. Okay. So, Steph, on that uh, comment on that front, yeah, thank you. The, the people that have been, you know, year over year, the champions of Woodby Island Race Week or various, you know, have been big time racers and it's important them to do well, they don't appeal the rating, they buy a different boat. 
Honestly, I mean, you don't mess around with that. You get the boat that has the most favorable rating and you buy that and go race that. That's, you know, that's how, that's, this is how the perf game is done. Thank you. I might, if I may, I, I might one. suggest, I might suggest another angle at the perf game and how it should be done because in my um, view, the, my understanding, and I've been sailing PHRF since um, up sometime in the seventies before some of you were born for sure. So, um, going back, my father was a PHRF handicapper. Um, and that had to be one of the most brutal, thankless volunteer jobs he's ever served in his life. And he was a dentist. So, um, <laughs> I have some perspective here and Betsy, let me just start by saying thank you, because this is one of those super thankless jobs. And whatever we're paying you for this, we should triple it right now. So thank you, Betsy. Right on. Okay. <laughs> so let's start with that. Bring the um, And so, so to, I, I, it's hard for me to take myself seriously. I take PHRF and sailboat racing very seriously, but laugh along with me here for a moment. My opinion of why PHRF is so incredible and wonderful and what a gift it is, is that it lets all of us get boats out of slips and sail around a race course together. That is what it is so successful at. It has always been successful at that where it, and, and to me, it's, it serves that purpose. If that is the mission statement of PHRF, and I don't actually know what the mission statement is right now of PHRF, but if that was the mission statement, it is a huge home run. And we should just take a little step back and respect it for, for what it is and what it isn't because it is run largely by volunteer energy. Um, and Bob, you're exactly right. If you do want to um, take detailed observations and um, go through some computer analysis and some race, we can, we can dive deep on that. And you are exactly right. You should be a volunteer on some board or providing somebody with that information <laughs> because volunteers should not have to do things like that. Um, otherwise, we wouldn't have any. So um, I'm all for all of that. So I hope, I hope what you're hearing from me so far is positive and yes, because that's how I intend it to be. Um, I think we should be just a little cautious when we jokingly, and I'm the first one to do this, but when we jokingly bash the Benetos like Mike's Larev or the Dragons, which are so dear to my heart. And I will tell you, I speak from some level of authority here as I am a former... Um, Dra sorry, I'm a former PHRF national champion in the country of Bermuda, and that happened to be one in a dragon in heavy air, Betsy, as you pointed out, because nothing else could compete with the dragon in heavy air. So um, everything so you that have I've the heard right here vote so for, far. Yeah, the right vote for the day. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Everything that I've heard so far is absolutely spot on. And thank you, Betsy, for this just great education on how it works and how they are trying over the decades to be a little bit more um, aware or absorb a little more information or be a little more thoughtful about how, less arbitrary and more thoughtful about how they do the ratings. Um, and I've got to say, it is remarkable. If, if any of us are here racing in PHRF or talking about PHRF ratings, and we're here for the trophy or the pickle dish or the I'm, I'm determined to win something in PHRF, that's the wrong reason to be here, in my opinion. And maybe I'm off base for saying that, but I'll just tell you over years of my experience with PHRF, it's why I love PHRF. It is as inclusive as it gets. It gives everybody a rating. Half the time, at least in the 70s and 80s, the people would be rated inadvertently, not the boats, um, until you would have a number of boats around. And hopefully some of that does not exist anymore, but maybe it does. But it is, it started with such a Fred Flintstone, imperfect, let's try to find a way to make it work mentality. And over the years, our world and technology have caught up, kind of gotten ahead on that. Um, at least that's what I would argue. And so now we're in this place where we're asking um, too much of what is a very basic rule um, meant to get boats out of slips and around a race course together so that we don't have two Martins and two J70s and a J24 and a Dragon all starting in different classes with one, two, and three boats. Um, let's all go and race together and have some fun. And if somebody sails extraordinarily well or nails the start or nails the first beat or sails a great race you know, in its completeness, 
that's fantastic and they should be congratulated for that whether or not they get the trophy. Um, to me, that's kind of how I view the sport and the competitive side of getting lots of boats out sailing around together. So um, I will finish now with where I meant to start, which was Betsy, thank you. It is a totally thankless job. And I know you spend a tremendous amount of your time. And I'm sure that not all the feedback you get is positive and loving, but you deserve it in a, a positive and loving way. So thank you for supporting us in this way, Betsy. You're welcome. Thank you. So as Ron was saying, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a thing to get people out on the water. That's, that's absolutely true. And, um, you know, there's been numerous other rating protocols that have come along and a lot of them have just gone by the wayside, but PHRF is still existing. Um, and it's not perfect, certainly not perfect, but if I tries, and, um, that's the whole point. And uh, we try to make it as equal as we can. And we try to close up the loopholes that some people try to exploit. So here we go. We, you know, we're, we're doing the best we can. And, and, and you know, it's, it's kind of interesting is that we have a boat in, in Anacortes, Mac Maiden Mall with Pangea, which is a Baltic 39, it has the same rating. I think it's the Vipers. And believe it or not, after multiple series they actually end up pretty close together in a, in a time that's amazing right? how that works out so many times that and you see this all the time in the phrf fleets big races and distance races and whatever where the boats when they when they come in and they get the handicap adjusted they're really close i mean it gets yeah. even though the handicap might be 100 seconds apart they they end up after adjustments ended up being tight. And it's, it's a testament to how well the, the perf system actually does work um, in, in reality. I mean, it really does give fair racing and it, it, it comes down to were you on the favorite part of the course or not, or did you get left in a, in a hole just sitting idle for a while and somebody else didn't? And, you know, especially like in around the county, that's where you more often than not, that's what it comes down to. Yeah. Hey, does anybody else have questions or comments? Hey, Betsy Boris here. Hey, I have a question and, and, and thanks for doing this tonight, you know, especially for, 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 for a rookie here, you know, who understands about maybe a quarter of what you guys are talking about. But one question <laughs> I have, you, you mentioned, um, you know, there's different, um, you know, for the same boat, maybe a different handicap applies in a different area, different state, different location. Um, but then you also said, and, and, and I wasn't sure if, if you know, I, I understood from you that basically you agreed with that. Um, because la later on you said, um, let's say, different boat sails different in different wind conditions. And, right. that, and that should be <clears throat> somehow taken into account. So... I thought that is exactly what is happening. That's why we have different different handicaps for for the same boat in different areas. Or, or you know, right? I, that is part I, the link right. there. Uh, yeah, that, that's right. I mean, and that's that's one reason why you have different handicaps in different areas. But you'll also see, um, especially boats that have a like a bigger one design fleet and are are still also racing PHRF. They they shouldn't be that different um, area to area. I mean, there's a little bit, there should be a, maybe a little difference, but if you compare, um, say a J33's rating in Texas and the J33's rating here, and then you re look at the, the J30 and we compare that to this area, the dissimilar things just the dissimilar things should be similar you know what i'm saying mm -hmm. so there should be about the same amount of difference between those two boats in this area as they are in that area gotcha okay but they, they may be rated faster overall in that same area okay in, in, like in texas than they are here but it's not a balanced team. approach it's not a balance um, well, it's it isn't exactly balanced no because but if you can have two boats that are 
fairly similar characteristics. Um, you know, they're, they're a, say a light displacement monohull boat um, with approximately the same sail area. You would expect them to be closely rated with, with in, in each area, mm -hmm. though they may not be the same here as there, right? So that's where you might get some dissimilarities that you might have an outlier that some boat, it didn't, the rating just didn't transfer well between areas, that can happen. And do you think that is because this is an observing, yeah, observant based system and not, not, not an AI system or based on all the, all the, all the races? Well, that could be part of it, you know, sometimes like, especially when there's a, a new boat to an area, if the top notch sailors have those, those boats, they're probably rated um, faster than they would might necessarily be because you have the best sailor sailing that boat and therefore it kind of, you know, you're not supposed to be handicapping the sailor, but it does skew the rating a little bit. What, what, one of the things, Boris, that, that is really complicated is that, or in, in Betsy, you talk about a high wind range, low wind range, and mm -hmm. it's, it's really a lot more complicated than that. And what you can oh. do is look at statistically over a lot of races and get a trend for how it works. But, for, you know, like, for example, um, you take my, like the J120 versus a Santa Cruz 27. So at like 15 knots downwind, that Santa Cruz is going to start to get up and go and the J120 is still going to sit there. Right, so it's, you know, like, and if you get to like 20 knots downwind, we're going about the same speed. And then you get up to 25 knots and now the Santa Cruz 27 is on its side and they, you know, they're not doing so good. And you get up to 35 knots and the 120 is just flying away. You know, so it's it's like, well, what, what, what you know, if it's 15 knots, the Santa Cruz 27 is eating its, you know, it's just, making its rating hugely. But at 25, it might be tied. At 30, the 120 is gonna be walking away from them and be, be saving their rating. But it, in, and then you get down to like eight knots, it's a different pick, every, every wind speed, it's a different picture as to which way, which boat's gonna make the rating and not rate, make the rating. So it, you can't, it's hard to put even a wind number on those in order to say all oh, high wind it's better and low wind it's different you know it it's just very complicated but on average you know like especially nice thing about around the county okay you start off it's 35 downwind and then you get up there and it's but now it's five knots right and you turn the corner and you're upwind you're upwind at 12 and you uh, the, just one race is a statistical averaging system that's taking the ratings up and down over a whole lot of different conditions where, you know, it's favoring one boat and then it's favoring the other boat and it's back and forth. And it's, uh, there's always that, you know, the phrase every dog have his day, but, you know, it like around the county, every hour has this dog, you know, that's, it's, it's his favorite mode, but it, uh, it on, it's a statistical average, you know, of all that is what, the observed performance ends up in over, you know, like a long race like Swiftsure, it's amazing how good the ratings actually hold up, you know, when it has that whole averaging thing to, to be able to, to work over. I came in a little late, um, Betsy, but I remember getting the PHRF code on my certificate and gave you like three numbers and then a letter and it's like, right. the, was it like five is standard? Right. And then upper or lower depends on your unstandard sale size? That's correct. Yeah, we went over that. And the, okay. and like saying that the M is for your, for boats that have outboards. Mm -hmm. If you have an inboard engine, you get five, 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 five. Gotcha. Thank you. So one of the things I would comment is on like for around the county that one of the better things about around the county is that there's so many boats and so many divisions that the rating bands and the similarity of the boats is really minimized, right? Like for 
our our division, Bob, you know, we're racing against a bunch of J120s, a bunch of J109s, and a couple of other boats that are somewhat similar, and their whole rating bands like 15 seconds. That's what makes it really work and makes PHRF look a whole lot better when you're not racing against the Santa Cruz 27 that you owe 110 seconds to. So it's, right. which, uh, I mean, maybe obviously what that actually points to is that, uh, you know, fair racing is, is one design racing because then you don't have the rating at all. That's, that's well, true. We, true. But, but, but that's not the point of PHRF. The point of PHRF is to let different boats race against each other. Not so everybody can come to the party. So hey, I got a either. Well, go ahead. Okay. Um, just a quick question. Can you um, about sort of something that's ancillary to PHRF, or maybe this is a question. Um, so time on time and time on distance seems to be specific to PHRF, correct? We don't have that with ORC and, and yes, other rating. We do, Chris. We do. Or, Oh yeah, I you know we can set up ORC time on time or the ORC certs have a mm -hmm. time on time and a time on distance uh, number and I've been scoring it using the time on time number for ORC uh, yeah. around the county. Okay. But the, on the cert, they both have they have both numbers. Okay. Do you have any some of the ratings? Some of the numbers are. Excuse me. Oh, go ahead, Bob. Keep going. Well, there's even it's even more complicated than that because they got like uh, some of the time on time or for buoy racing or offshore racing, you know. So you you there's a, a a lot of numbers to choose from when you look at the cert. Mm -hmm. I guess are there conventions? I mean, we seem to use time on um, time for buoy racing around here, time on dis or time on distance for the distance racing. I mean, are the, is PERF weighing in on when those should be or is that just the race organizers are choosing those? Well, one of the problems that comes in with time on time is that um, it, that hurts us for around the county and it creates more upset than not is when you're scoring time on time and we end up everybody in the fleet ends up waiting at some junction, jun some juncture, right? And the time keeps running. And that's equivalent to say, like it was a 30 mile leg, but now if we all park for two hours and not doing much, it's now a 50 mile leg and it's harder to make your handicap because the time just keeps clocking away and it becomes unfair. And those extreme uh, conditions don't happen when you run in time on distance. But the, the, and the, the thing about the time on distance is you have to know the exact course length, right? So you need to know precisely. Now you go out on West Sound and you just throw some marker buoys around here. Nobody measures the course distance. So how you can't even do a time on distance, right? And it's somewhat of a, it's a smaller place and everybody right. can finish within an hour. And there's, you know, it, it's, it's, it works better time on time. I mean, that's kind of the, how that, that shakes out. And we do use on the time on time, there is an ability to put in a low wind, medium wind or high wind day. And it sort of compensates out for these, you know, it's sort of like the boats are having, you know, struggling to get around the course. The boats are kind of most of the time at hall speed or like, they're all the time at hull speed. And that's the three conditions that we put into our race results on West Sound. It used to be on the websites for US sailing. And for some reason they took it out. I mean, their time on time now just is like one number. And they don't do that kind of thing with ORC either. But does that answer your question? No, There's it's helpful. That's great, thanks. Yeah, so as Bob mentioned, when you have Time on time is usually favors actually the slower boats and time on distance usually favors the faster boats. I mean, just in general, but the, the thing about time on time that when it falls apart, as Bob said, when everybody, if you park, time is still going by. And so the slowest boats are gaining on everybody. So in red, I always loved it when we all stopped. Oh God, we're gaining. <laughs> 
So, okay. Anything else for anybody? I, I got one other question. Okay. If we have two one kind fleets out to this summer coming up, yeah. we have the A70 people and we have the Martin people. Who's going to be left sailing PHRF? You know, uh, the, the uh, Merit 20 well, is gone. Stan, savvy. Um, Stan, maybe. Mark Rick. got a Rick, yeah, Rick Rhodes. Eric, I think the, the answer I would throw out is anybody who wants the yeah, how shields, gonna, the how are gonna, gonna, anybody. How are we going to recruit for that? How are we going to press for that? Because it used to be, you go back not very long ago, and for like the history of the whole Yacht Club, everybody that raced was perf. So we would get 10 boats, you know, typically, or, you know, I don't know, six, 15 boats, and they all raced one division perf. And uh, it was kind of sweet that way. Well, this is not what we're going to have, but if we're going to have a perf division with six boats, we're going to, we might want to be thinking about, you know, doing some recruiting or talking that up or how, you know, what are we looking at on the, on the perf racing out there since everybody's gone to one kind? Well, Bob, I, I would suggest that we, we should always be recruiting. That's, that's yeah. on all of us to always be recruiting, number one. That's how the sport of sailing still exists today. However, I'm, I'm kind of envisioning and hoping um, that we would have all the J70s, all the Martins, um, no different than we did last summer, all racing PHRF together. That's what I would hope. Um, maybe we choose to score them separately. Maybe the J70 owners all get together and decide, you know, it'd just be better if they just race by themselves. Um, my personal suggestion, if anybody asked me, would be for sure we should all always start together. If we can be sailing the same course, I think that's going to work great. I don't think that would be any different. I personally would love to see, and I think the answer to your question is how do we best recruit? I'd love to see 30 boats out there racing on Wednesdays and Fridays and Sundays, or you name the day or night. And we see the bay filled with, you know, West Sound should be packed with sailboats, colorful spinnakers, and everybody out there having a good time. And everybody else kind of looking on saying, you know what, that would be really fun to try sometime. How do I get involved? And then we feed them over to Steve Ferno and Burke and in the get, you know, and that's kind of how the whole circle should operate in my view. Yeah, good point. Yeah, I, I agree with, with Ron is we all need to be out there recruiting and, and promoting the sport and, and all out there racing together. It doesn't matter what boat you have. It's, it's get the boats out of the slips. Um, let's have some fun. Let's get out on the race course. And, and for those who want to get involved in racing, um, you know, those, those of you guys who have a boat, look at the crew bank list and, um, you know, let's get those people out on boats. And when they get hooked, they may want to purchase a boat. And there's another boat that's, that's adding to the fleet, whatever that is. Um, that list is, is, filling up there's quite a few people that have put their name on that crew bank list so take a look at that and we want to encourage you know anybody that's got a boat to pick up somebody and bring them out on a Wednesday or a Friday and and you know we've got a great thing going here we've got a good vibe let's keep it going and and hey Bob fun story um Betsy Betsy uh approached me at one point you know we were just having a chat and she's like yeah well you know with you know if you want to sail without the motor you know you got you're gonna have a different handicap and so, you know, we, long story short, all J70 owners agreed, sure, let's, uh, let's put the motor below deck when we're sailing. And let's, let's, you know, bottom line, we, all the J70, uh, you know, owners have made the same decision. We want to race with everybody else under the same, um, you know, uh, you know not, not as one class, not rated individually. And actually, we just went through that exercise where, where Ron contacted everybody. What do you want to do? You want to race with your motor on the bracket, motor on the dock, you know, motor below deck. And everybody basically said, we, you know, whatever it is, what we have to do so we can all race together with everybody else and as many boats as possible on the starting line. So that's the case in point. And, and uh, you know, we're going to re-rate the, you know, we're going to have a different handicap. You know, we're going to... Uh, I don't know if that's a correct technical term that we're going to be re-rated with 129 versus 135. 
So I, a comment I'd like to make, and Boris, if, if you're sailing in a J70 with the motors down below with everybody else, you know, yeah, I think that's a safety thing not to have the motors hanging off the back, especially in a J70 where it affects so many things like the turning of the tiller and heavy wind. So I think that's going to be good. And if you're going to win PHRF in a J70, you're going to have to sail damn really good. You're really going to have to sail out of your head to win in PHRF in a J70. And that's, to me, that's kind of how it should be. But the question I had, Ken, was actually for you. Um, I, I feel like we've had such great success in the past few weeks with that crew bank list on the website. You did such a nice job getting that up there and promoting that. I almost wonder if we shouldn't also have sort of a used boat or for sale or a boat classified, not just boats here at West Sound for sale, but boats in the area that are for sale. Because I really think that that's the perfect entry level boat is one of these boats that you can snap up, maybe a soling, for example, or something you can snap up for pretty inexpensive, certainly under 10 grand, maybe for two or three grand or less put the boat in the water, keep it on a mooring ball, find a way to get the boat out sailing with PHRF. To me, that's the perfect entry level for so many people here on island or people who might just um, come and want to sail with, you know, their grand, their grandparents or their grandkids or whoever it might be. Um, but I, I remember when I first came here, that was the Solings were so successful here and they had such a good time, sort of one design, sort of PHRF. Um, but everybody was out there sailing around in these in these great soulings. Some of them are still here on trailers. And if anybody's willing to sell any of those or Catalina 27s or anything that's taking up space, um, anytime you can get a boat off the trailer and onto the race course is a big win. Um, you know, to me, that's the perfect vehicle to recruit. So Ken, my my direct question would be, I wonder if we couldn't do some kind of a, um, a boat bank or a for sale or classifies for boats that made sense. So I'll, I'll leave it to you, Ken. Well, well I'll, I'll just got three soulings. <laughs> I'll, I'll just defer that over to Steph. That that was that was her inspiration. I, I helped her on the tech, but that's all Steph's accomplishment. Um, and I would say yes, Steph. If you want a buy sell page on there, um, we can we can easily add that either to the same document as another tab or as a totally separate document. But we could certainly do that. So, Ron, I'm I'm so glad you brought that up because that's exactly how I got into sailing. Um, um, I don't know if a lot of you guys know, but I had a cardiac arrest um, in 2012, and my doctors wanted me to quit uh, running. They said, "Quit running. It's it's not good for you. You know, you, you had a cardiac arrest. You you died on the finish course. You're a one percent survival chance." And they he encouraged me to get into sailing, and I had done sailing in England and got out of it. And so I decided, okay, I'll, I'll get back into sailing. And that was my first boat. I bought a Columbia 26 for $2,500 and fixed it up, learned, you know, learned a lot about it. And I was still recovering from the open heart surgery. And I was helping Tacoma Women's Sailing Association teach women to sail. And I decided I got to get this boat off the dock once, you know, once a week. It's this is costing me too much in mortgage and, and fees and maintenance. And I said to the ladies, why don't we start racing on Wednesday nights? You know, Corinthian Yacht Club. I was a Tacoma Yacht Club member. Corinthians racing over there. Let's just go start racing. I didn't have a clue what I was doing. I didn't know about perf. I, I went into the cruising class. I was the last boat across the start line. And it was the Corinthian Club that, that got me into racing. I got hooked and then you know, I, I outgrew the, the Columbia and I went to the J33, but that's how we get started. And, and that's the vibe of all of us helping these new people. It doesn't matter what boat you're in. I was always the slowest boat. I was always the last boat to cross the finish line, but I had a darn good rating as long as I could keep the boats in sight and I learned from them on what they were doing. I mean, that's, that's how I learned to sail and, oh, you know, they, they're doing really well there. They got their, their sails set this way. Um, I did really well on that Columbia 26. So I think that's an awesome idea and we need to encourage people. We don't need to have, you know, expensive boats out there. We just need to be out there. We need to have fun. We need to encourage people. And, you know, it's, it's, it's addictive. Once you get out there and you get going, it doesn't matter what, what the boat you're on. You just, it's about having fun. It's about socializing. It's about meeting friends and, and, and sailing is just, you know, it's a great avenue to do that. Yep. Well said. Even in like a free section, you know, because I'm sure yeah. every boater here has got a pile of crap somewhere. Hey, I think so. I think so. Orcus is looking to get rid of a, uh, a Cal 20 um, that, you know, that could be our first one that we 
we put up on there. Absolutely. So, Count Leo, let's get that one listed, Burke. I don't know if, if Tacoma Yacht Club was picking up. That was another boat I owned for a while. That's a great first beginner boat. It is. Is so is Sam going to get uh, the Salt Heart out this year? Hey, team. Yeah. Um, I yeah. don't know how to. I, I can comment. Sam, Sam and I have worked together. We're good friends. And he wants the community to know that he has some medical issues and he had open uh, brain surgery and got a tumor removed about a month ago. He's recovering, riding a bike. But he's got a long haul in front of him. He's going to have some chemo, radiation, and so he's encouraged to come sail. But I don't know if Salt Hop is going to come in. He's going to come sail my boat anytime it's available. He was him and Maggie were planning to be the spring sailors on my boat until they got diagnosed with this, um, and I had to be Eastern Washington. Now he can't do that as he's getting treatment in Seattle. But I think Doc White might sail a little bit and others. But um, Sam is on Guamus now. He's recovered two weeks um, and will know a path forward here. Uh, so give him love. Open up your boats. If he's wandering around West Sound, give him a boat to sail. That'd be my advice to all you guys. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that, Bert. Uh, yeah, it, he can tell more if he wants, but it's yeah. he's got a big, big, tough row ahead of him here, guys. So give him a hug. Okay. All right, does anybody else have any more questions for Betsy or? East Sound Spring Regatta. Yes. Um, that's still a go. Uh, do you need help doing anything? Um... Um, yes, East Sound Spring Regatta is, is a go. The NORs are posted um, up onto the website. We're looking at opening registration, I think it, towards the end of this week. Ken, is that still a go? Yep. As soon as we figure out yep. the liability waiver stuff, we're good. We're yep. Done. yep. So we're just, we're finishing up, finishing up some stuff. Um, Jeff, I will contact you. I'm, I'm not quite sure exactly where we are on uh, help with um, race committee and um, some of the mark set boats. So um, let we're me, uh, we, we are all set. We got everybody in place. Yeah. I just didn't know if you needed okay. some work, you know, some help doing anything else. So okay. Yeah, if something comes up, that we'll we'll definitely uh, let let you know about that. Thank you. And the other thing, the other thing too, I'll just plug right now. If everybody's got a, a chance, uh, Chris Wolf came up with an awesome idea of of um, and suggesting that our regattas and our races be clean regattas. Um, meet in, and take a look. So we developed a um, OIYC clean regatta policy, and East Sound Spring Regatta will be a a clean regatta. So that means you know. Um, doing good for the environment and our Salish seas. It's, um, you know, plastics, um, using reusable bottles. It's, it, there's a whole bunch of different things. Um, my brain's escaping me on, on the details of it. So Chris, jump in if, if you want to, but this is a fantastic, oh, there we go. Ken's brought it up. You have to make it a little bit bigger, Ken. No, we, you got it. So, um, but but it is posted on the East Sound Spring Regatta uh, website, and it's about our goals: less waste, no discharge, emissions reduction, locally sourced um, things that we can do, education and management, and and how you can help. Um, you know, as as racers and boats, it's all listed up there. And so, it's East Sound Spring Regatta is going to be a clean regatta, and we're looking at all of our races for this year to be clean races which I'm, I'm really excited about. So thank you, Chris Wolf, for, for that. And this is all part of the Sailors of the Sea. I think it's awesome what you all put together. Um, and I just love the idea. And, you know, I think we can share that with other yacht clubs. Yeah. Um, it's, it's been a big focus on the NORs for the uh, regional and, and national events on college and high school too. And, and it's been a learning curve, but there's lots of good momentum. And I think it's, it speaks well for our sport. And a subject, plastic water bottles. <laughs> I have a somewhat I, related I just, question for East Sound Regatta. Yeah, go ahead. It, how do we get a reservation for Rosario? I've tried calling and no luck so far. Any other ideas? <laughs> the theory just works on Thursday through Mondays. So mm -hmm. if you've left a voicemail, he'll give you a call back. Okay. 
Yeah, if you get, get your but get your reservations in, I know that uh, when Ken and I spoke to him earlier this week, maybe it was last week, late last week, um, the slips are filling up, um, but they're working working with us to make sure we get everybody in. So Justin, are you're taking your seventy over, not the one eleven? We're going to take both boats, but the one eleven is a cruiser to sleep on, oh. and a tow boat. Sweet. So they we were going to have... wait and see. They were going to wait and see if it's light air or heavy air, Bob. I think to decide <laughs> which boat to go. It's a good strategy. So we are going to ask if people bring motherships over and race boats, just so we don't have to turn people away. That if you are going to have an extra boat there, to be willing to go out on a mooring. I can tell you, I had good luck. I left a voicemail for Terry, the uh, um, dock master there uh, on a Thursday. And I did, in fact, get a call back on Monday. And he was super helpful and signed us right up and um, gave us what we needed. And he charged 23 bucks a night for a 23-foot J70. So um, I thought that was pretty darn reasonable. Yeah. So he did, he did tell us that as a resort or um, facility that they're not going to ask anybody to raft up, but if, um, if you are willing to raft up, I think the Martins and the J seventies are more than likely to, to be just willing to, to raft up that um, we coordinate that on our behalf. He just doesn't want to have any, anything to do with it. And he's, he's still probably um, hesitant to even allow it to happen, but um, just from a liability perspective. So hopefully we can fit everybody in and not have to turn anybody away. Ken, when we when we do that with both those boats, especially, they have such long spreaders. We just want to be really careful. Anybody who's responsible for tying a J70 or a, a Martin 242 together that you push one mast at least four or five feet ahead or behind the other or reverse bow and stern um, because the, the spreaders on those boats are so wide that we've had problems over the past years in different uh, locations. A couple of waves come through and the spreaders clip each other um, and it gets to be an expensive repair. So just do be careful with those two kinds of boats. Um, whether they're rafted Martin to Martin or J to J, you just wanna be a little careful and help others understand that because not everybody's aware of that. Yep. Great point, Ron, thank you. Could I ask a logistical question about that regatta having never done it before? Is there, can you tell me what I can um, expect as far as when we get in from racing, will the Cascadia Grill be open for food to go? Is it a bring your own beer and situation? Is it a, how, what, what is the, what is the situation and what's the policy and how should we um, handle things in the most respectful way possible? And of course we want to support those that are supporting us. So what would you advise us, those of you that have done it before, please? So I, I would say the Cascadia Grill is almost certainly not going to be open. It typically doesn't open up each season until May. We try to get them to open it up just for us. And it just takes so much to, to, to set the thing up that um, they weren't willing to do that before they were actually ready to open up for the season. Assuming COVID continues how it is, I would expect the resort itself to be open. Probably smart that if you do want to eat at the resort for dinner, make reservations ASAP because racers, particularly those that are staying in the marina, will will likely want to go there. And there's there's some crews that um, you know come over from Anacors or Bellingham, but some someone in their crew brings a car or gets loaned a car from here and they'll run up to town and have dinner. Um, so um, we typically would have something social going on, but this year we're just we're just not able to plan for that. Just have to wing it. So Betsy's Betsy's usually held a, an opening night reception on Friday night, but I think because of COVID, we're, it's just not smart for us to plan on that this year. Yeah, my, my advice would be to, you know, plan your own food, make reservations at Rosario or have a car to, to get up into town and, and eat at one of the facilities in town or some sort of transportation. Thank you. Could we get a, a delivery bus to bring a bunch of Portofino down to the marina? <laughs> oh, there you go. There you go. But we could pull that off. Yeah, it's a great, great idea. Supporting local and then, then sitting in distance, uh, un, un, unorganized uh, after after uh, something would be great. Ne next year I'll bring, next year I'll bring my barbecue for you guys if they let me. Well, ne next year they might be open. <laughs> <laughs> we had that a great plan in place for last year's event where we we're going to open up the ballroom and have a catered dinner and band and. 
so forth. So maybe next year we'll get back to that. Oh, that'd be so much fun. Yeah, hopefully. Okay, well, I'm going to sign off. Unless yep. anybody has more questions for me, because I'm cooking dinner here for St. Patrick's Day. So, got to get that. Thanks, Betsy. Thanks, Bets. Thank you, Betsy. Yeah, thank, thank, thank you, you Betsy. very much, Betsy. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Good night, Betsy. Thank you so much. Sunday. Yeah. Cheers.